Department, Irfan Siddiqui. Irfan received his bachelor's degree from Harvard University, cum laude in chemistry and physics in 1997. He then moved to the Applied Physics Department at Yale, where he received his MS, his MPhil, and finally his PhD in 2002. He then stayed there for some years as a postdoc before joining our department as an assistant professor in 2005. And we promoted him to associate professor subsequently in 2011. Amongst his many activities within the department, Irfan serves as the head graduate advisor. He's also started his own company, which I think is a little unusual, um, and it's entitled simply Irfan Siddiqui Quantum Consulting. <laughs> Irfan has received numerous awards for his accomplishments, and I think the most outstanding one is the George E. Valley Prize of the American Physical Society, which he received in 2006. And this award recognizes one individual in the early stages of his or her career for an outstanding scientific contribution to physics. The awardee must have received his or her PhD within the previous five years. The prize consists of a very nice $20,000 and a certificate citing the contribution, which I will read. For the development of the Josephson bifurcation amplifier for ultra-sensitive measurements at the quantum limit. And I think that serves as a very fitting introduction to, to Irfan. He's also received various other awards, the Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award, and the DARPA Young Faculty Award. Finally, on a personal note, I should point out that Irfan's postdoctoral advisor at Yale was Michelle Devere. And Michelle was my own postdoc many years ago. And therefore, Irfan is my academic grandson. <laughs> on that note, let's Join, join me in inviting Irfan to give this presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by thanking you, John, for those very kind words of introduction. And to say that it's absolutely a pleasure to be giving at a talk at home amongst friends and colleagues. So can everyone hear me in the back? Okay, all right. So the title of the talk is, is Before You. We will try to unravel those questions that exist at the foundations of quantum mechanics and hopefully we'll find more questions uh, to keep us all gainfully employed for the next decade looking at quantum mechanics. And I want to start off the talk by sharing with you what I think is the most valuable aspect and element of our lab and that, that is its people. Okay. The work that you'll see today is really an effort by many folks, significant number of them shown there, significant number that have gone off, and also our three collaborators who are listed here. And in particular, for today's presentation, I'd like to thank two individuals, Dr. Emmanuel Florine and Chris Macklin, who have worked hard preparing all the animation that you'll see today. That being said, I thought I would give a one slide introduction to quantum mechanics. And it's uh, my class will hopefully vote that this is exactly the same one that I gave them. Okay, which is what are the two principles that one would need for today's talk that are essentially quantum. And in particular, you can imagine the roadrunner climbing a, a hill here. And in particular, if you look closely at the hill, the first thing that you see is the world is grainy, right? And in fact, the roadrunner is going th through various quantized states. And in particular, if we don't have a good image of what's happening with the roadrunner, he may simply be in a superposition of a few of those steps at any given time. Okay. Further, quantum theory tells us that if you actually do look at his feet carefully by appropriate choice of measurement apparatus, okay, the roadrunner will have to stop on one of the states. Okay. And that is to say measurement projects into a single state, whether it be number one, two, or three, and the probability of being in one, two, or three is given by how I break down the initial state. 
state. And indeed, I need the kun of quantum mechanics. And we will start with this and see what other puzzles still remain, given this one slight introduction to the theory of everything. In particular, the formalism that was put together for the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics is really put together by an absolutely outstanding and illustrious set of folks. This is a very historic picture from the 1927 Solvay Conference, and you can certainly identify interesting fellows here, 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 all the fathers of modern quantum mechanics, and also Marie Curie with her two Nobel Prizes here. And in particular, of the 27 people that are here, it is said that 17 either won or did go on to win the Nobel Prize. That's quite a group photo for a conference. And in particular, the mathematics that they came up with explains so much of that which is around us. Right? That mathematical structure explains subatomic particles, chemistry, solid state physics, NMR, optics, semiconductor science, superfluidity, so on and so forth, those things which are commonplace to us. So it's very interesting that at this point, having a mathematical formalism, which explains so many things, is commented upon in the following way by one of the best physicists of our time, Richard Feynman. He says, I think it is safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. Even having this, this successful formalism, Feynman makes the statement, I think it's safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. Do not keep saying to yourself, if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it be like that? Because you will go down the drain into a blind alley from which no one has yet escaped. Nobody knows how it can be like that. So this is really a testament to the richness of this theory and really the two parts of this theory, if you like. There is the mathematical formalism right, which is tremendously successful and tested to a level perhaps no other theory has been tested to. At the same time, it's a formalism in search of an interpretation. Right? We still ask ourselves, what is the physical world for which that is the mathematical description? And perhaps that is what Feynman was, was alluding to. So I want to start off with one of those fundamental questions. This is known as the measurement problem. So the quantum system that I want to talk about today is going to be a spin. Okay? In particular, a spin a half, like an electron, which can be up or down. If you like to think in terms of cats, it can be asleep and awake. If you like to think in, in terms of any other two-level system, I'm particularly a cat lover, so I'm going to stick to the uh, spin formalism. <laughs> spin up and spin down. If you take an electron, those are the two states that you find it in. Okay. And the point is that quantum mechanics tells you that you can make spin sideways, right? which is not spin up nor spin down. But in reality, is a combination of those things that we find in real life, spin up and spin down. So the real question is, you have this gap. You have the quantum world, which tells us all these extraordinary, extravagant things can be there. But at the end of the day, we have to perceive them. Right? How do you perceive these things? And it's measurement that brings back everyday experience. And somehow this fantastic quantum world turns into something that we can experience every day. But here's the problem. Okay. This meter, which is shown here, obeys the same quantum mechanics as this spin. Okay? So if I use this meter now and take Schrodinger's equation, whatever formulation, if you like, then one would predict that you should measure a meter which is in a com combination of red and blue. Right? Your meter should also go into a superposition of red and blue. The problem is it doesn't do that. We don't observe a meter in a combination like this measurement problem in quantum mechanics. How do you get that everyday reality from something which is a superposition? So what is observed is this. Half of the time you get the red result, half of the time you get the blue result, and the, the statement which is said is that the wave function is collapsed. Right? You had a wave function which described a complex superposition, now we described only one state. And this is the debate, how does it collapse? What is the collapse? This, what is the mechanism for collapse? Schrodinger equation will not collapse it for you. Right? So how do you collapse this wave function? So how do you collapse it? David Wallace had a very interesting comment. He's a good physicist at the University of Oxford thinking about fundamentals of quantum mechanics. And he said about this problem, well, you see, there's two camps. There's philosophers and physicists. The physicists, they want better philosophy about the theory. And the philosophers want better physics. <laughs> and this actually described, I think, some of the alternative views that are out there. So what are alternative views? 
Well, there's one put forward by Dublogi and Bohm, called Bohmian mechanics. And the idea is that you have waves and you have particles, right? And the trajectory of the particles are guided by the waves. And it turns out you can show that many, if not all of these predictions in the conventional, they are reproduced in this formalism. So that's adding more equations. Then you have the many worlds interpretation, which was really put forward by Hugh Everett, the student of gravity guru uh, Wheeler at Princeton. And the idea is that the wave function never actually collapses. All of those outcomes actually happen. Spin up happens, spin down happens. They just don't happen in the same world. One happens here, the other ones happen in different worlds. And then you may ask, but isn't life deterministic? I do an experiment half of the time it's up, half of the time it's down. And the way out of that is to think of the following that we actually don't know which world we're in. Okay, so that's a serious comment about subjective probability, right? It's true, we will get one of the answers, we don't know which one. So you recover the statistical aspect. And finally, there's an idea of spontaneous collapse. And this is a very old idea going back all the way to von Neumann in the beginning that said in reality, when you do a measurement in some very many body system, there should be some other process which takes over. The short energy equation should have some term perhaps that corrects for this and it took a long time until very recently Girardi, Rimini and Weber came up with their version of the Schrodinger equation, which has another term in there to cause this collapse for microscopic objects. So you can see the two levels, either interpreting things differently, either putting in more mechanics, but I'm going to give you yet another way to look at this problem because I'm not smart enough to be a philosopher. So the experimentalist way to look at this is let's try to measure what happens in this particular process, right? And quantify the collapse process, right? And then we can pick whatever way we'd like to interpret it afterwards but let's try to put some data, some mathematics to this little part which was not explained in the Copenhagen, Copenhagen picture. Okay. So at this point, uh, there is half of me which is an engineer that says, well, that's great. Quantum mechanics will still work for all the experiments you want to do. I see Professor Yobanovich thinking, this is great. You understand the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. I still build all the machines the same way. Uh, it may be a little bit beyond that. If we now have a concept of how to understand precision measurement, precision control, then we're in a better position to realize quantum machines, right? Machines that really use this coherent aspect of quantum mechanics that haven't been realized up till now. In particular, the quantum computer is one of them. If I had one, it would be a different slide, but I don't have one. So this is the best I can do at the moment for a quantum computer. And the idea being that this is a machine that realizes quantum coherent interactions, how do you measure it? How do you program it? These are fundamental questions which are there and they're relevant because it is estimated at least in a few surveys that the quantum information market will be $26 billion. Right? That's the investment worldwide. So there's certainly more than simply fundamental physics going on with this science. And in particular, the idea of computing is simply to go ahead and execute those algorithms which are classically difficult, such as factoring a number into its primes. This is a very good way to encode information as shown by Ravis Shamir and Ilman, RSA, many years ago on the MIT campus. Okay. Moreover, we can think about using quantum systems as simulators for other physical systems, such as lattice models, or quantum cosmology models, or high TC superconductors, things that are difficult to solve on a classical machine, but maybe hardware-wise could be emulated. Okay. And finally, in the real nuts and bolts level, thinking about sensors that use quantum mechanics for enhanced sensitivity, whether you're measuring single microwave photons, squeeze light as we do in our group, okay, or atomic properties with circuits, or even very small magnetic fields. So just to round it out, there is a menagerie of applications for this quantum science if we can understand its fundamentals and harness them. Okay, so I wanted to ask this tongue-in-cheek question, how does one measure the measurement process? because this is clearly a challenge. If we measure a system in quantum mechanics, we perturb it. You measure your spin, it goes to up or down, right? So how do we access this realm? So let's imagine we start again with spin sideways or zero plus one thereof. And the idea is if I would like to probe this system, I'm going to perturb it, so maybe I shouldn't probe it. Maybe I should try to hide it, okay? And if I hide it, I run into this fundamental problem that you and I are all sharing at the moment. Can you see where the spin is? <laughs> so you cannot hide it too hard, okay? So if you decouple it from this environment, you don't learn anything about it. So we haven't gotten very far. 
Moreover, that situation is actually not realizable in real life because there's always somebody there. Okay? And when they look at your spin, they perturb it. Right? So who are these pairs of eyes? It's a long list. Photons from 60 hertz to gamma rays, phonons, magnons, defects, maybe gravity, maybe your consciousness, maybe things I don't understand. <laughs> That's tough. All right, so all of these things will cause your spin to relax. So really, the name of the game here is the decoherence is information lost. Okay? Because these eyes are the most deadly ones. Because they look at your system, they extract information from it and don't tell you. Right? And that's where you lose track of the phase. So decoherence is really information lost. It isn't destroyed, it's in some set of observers that you can't talk to. They're not in good terms with you. So the way out of this is to be the only observer in the problem, right? the dominant observer in the problem, but that means I have to do the following, somehow use the collected information to recon reconstruct the state and design an apparatus which is high efficiency and faster than the environment. Right? So I have to extract information faster than my competitors and also do a good job at it. If I lose the information which is in the system, then I can't reconstruct it. So that's the name of the game. In our lab, we do this using atoms which we construct from circuits. This gives us the flexibility to tune all their parameters, all their couplets, all their strengths, as you like. So the recipe for constructing a atom-like object from a circuit is quite simple. An atom, and no offense intended to atomic physicists, I started off in AMO physics, so you know, please allow me to make the statement, that an atom is simply an anharmonic oscillator. Right. It's an oscillator with energy levels which are not equally spaced, so that's the name of the game. How do I realize that in circuits? Well, the linear oscillator is very easy. It's just an LC circuit. So I can imagine making a little spiral, which is a spiral inductor and a capacitor with let's say <coughs> a, few, uh, a few millimeters of wire and a few hundred microns of plates. That will give us a resonant frequency of about a gigahertz. So you have all of these things in your pockets and your cellular phones. If I make such an oscillator out of aluminum, and cool it to low temperatures, the quality factor, the number of times I can oscillate that system without losing energy is at least a million. Right? And if you did that with an ordinary piece of copper at room temperature, it'd be 10. So the idea of using these superconductors is that you can have long lived coherence in these circuits. Okay? Formally, I know you, Rafael, you are, you are here, so I must present some kind of commutator relation. So here's L and C, so it has charge and flux, and there'll be a ca canonical commutation relation like, Everything's good, right? Good. So, okay, but it's linked to currents and voltages, right? So this is interesting. The electrical engineer actually can manipulate currents and voltages, and it's just like playing with a real quantum, bona fide quantum system. At the same time, the level spacing in a harmonic oscillator is one uniform and B equal to h bar omega, its frequency. For one gigahertz, that's 50 millikelvin. Okay. So if we would like to occupy the ground state, we do something uncreative, which is simply cool to much below 50 millikelvin. Right, so we cool down to 10 millikelvin, and that solves the temperature problem for us. Okay. The other problem which still remains is the nonlinearity. This is a linear system, and in particular, I can't isolate two of the levels. Right? If I put in an excitation, I could drive any one of those transitions. So I have to replace either the L or the C, and I don't know how to make the C nonlinear, so I stick with the L. So we take the inductor and replace it with a tunneling junction. Okay. If I put in a tunneling junction, Josephson told us the current across it is sine of the phase difference across the junction. You can think of the current as a force. So integrating that, you get a potential, which is a cosine potential. So if you like, a superconducting qubit is a particle in a cosine box. Okay. And those are the energy levels that you have. Typically, we have about four or five levels in an aluminum qubit. Okay. So building one of these things, you start with very good quality films, deposited by either sputtering, or electron beam deposition patterned by e-beam lithography, and you get nice submicron junctions. Uh, this is all work done here in labs at Berkeley. So this is aluminum aluminum oxide technology. Okay. Now that's only half of the story. I make the qubit. The qubit is an atom, right? It's a system with unequally spaced levels, but it cannot be in free space. So an atom, a real atom, rubidium, cesium, whatever you like. You can place it in free space because it doesn't come to its environment very strongly. Right? So the free relaxation in free space is slow. This is very close to 377 ohms, right? which is the impedance of free space.
So if I put it in free space, the quantum mechanics will go away very rapidly. So the trick to preserve quantum coherence is to put it in a cavity. Okay? And if you put it in a cavity with a single resonant frequency, there are two advantages for this. One, you hide the environment except the one frequency that you want to probe with. Okay? So you remember the eyes? This gets rid of most of them except the ones at that one frequency. And moreover, okay, the Hamiltonian that describes the situation has the following terms. This is the famous James Cummings Hamiltonian. You have a two-level system coupled to a radiation field, and then you have a term which swaps excitations right, from the light into the matter and vice versa. If the frequency of the oscillator and, and the cavity are different, you can rewrite this in the dispersive limit. And what you have is that inserting this qubit simply pulls the frequency of the resonator. Okay? So if I were to now try to pass light through this resonator, I would get a peak at one and a peak at zero that are separated in frequency. Okay? This is the quantum version of a really easy high school physics effect. If you take a capacitor and you put a dielectric in it, you change the energy which is inside. Okay? That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm taking a cavity, I'm putting a dielectric material in it, which is changing its frequency. The only upshot is my dielectric has two states. It's spin up or spin down. Right? So you get a different transmission depending on whether it's spin up or spin down. Okay? So this is how one reads out in cavity QED, if you like, such qubits. Okay, so here's a picture of a chip. All the new parts are there. Now you can bond it to the rest of the world once it's inside its cavity. And now the hard work begins because I mentioned this, going back to this slide, this effect in atomic physics is the stock effect. Right? So if you put an atom in an electric field, you shift its frequency. So to study the measurement problem, we would like to vary the separation of these histograms to change the amount of measurement that I have. The weakest measurement I can do is put no photons in there. Right? I have a cavity and I don't probe it. That's the weakest measurement you can do. And then as you add photons, listed here as n bar, that's going to pull them apart further. The tricky part is this situation where I've pulled the histogram apart, that happens when there's already one photon in the cavity. <laughs> okay. So if I would like to measure now this relaxation, this collapse of the wave function, I need to resolve at least of order one photon, if not better, in a microsecond. That's a hard, hard problem. There are no commercial amplifiers from Thor Lab that they will send you with little dino snacks or anything else that will do that for you. <laughs> right? We'll have to go ahead and make that amplifier, and that's what we do. Right? We make superconducting parametric amplifiers that work extremely close to the quantum limit of sensitivity to read out these microwave photons. Okay. All of it goes in a dilution refrigerator shown here, okay? cooling down to 10 millikelvin or so. Okay. So what is it that we actually measure? Okay. So I tried to blend together full optics with real microwave elements. Okay. So here's the chip. Here's the amplifier. And the idea is, let's imagine your chip is in a superposition of up plus down. You excite it with a light beam. Interacting with the system separates the beams slightly into red and blue, different beam for whether you have spin up or, or spin down. And the amplifier goes ahead and increases the intensity of the signal and also the separation. Okay? So this amplifier, this signal here is of order a photon or less coming out is much more intense. And I've drawn this curious meter at the end in that we measure phase in volts, okay? which is a strange comment here. You measure phase in an angular degree of freedom. So what's happening here is the red and blue are really microwave excitation that have different phase and we extract the amplitude and phase by mixers and what have you, other components, such that a voltage on a voltmeter is telling me about the phase of this wave. Okay? So as an experimentalist, I'm measuring things in volts, but in reality, I'm measuring the phase, if you like, of these two waves. Okay. All right, so what kind of measurements can I do? This is a real histogram. Okay? So the red histogram corresponds to taking a, a spin, putting it in one state, measuring it many, many times. And the blue one corresponds to putting it in the down state, measuring it many, many times. And as you can see there, you don't learn a lot from that one. Right? But the histograms are not separated very much. And the idea is this is called a weak measurement of the system. Right? And the point is that measure weakly does not project it immediately from the 0 plus 1 state automatically to the 0. It just kicks it slightly towards one of the stages. If I'd like to measure better and get more than partial information, 
I can integrate for a certain time tau, and you see the histograms narrow. Right. Now I can distinguish between the two states, or I can put more photons into the system and simply increase the intensity of the stark effect. So these are two ways I can go from partial measurement or weak measurement to strong measurement for tomography. And both of these things are used in our measurement. Right? When we want to peer into the actual collapse of the wave function, we do the weak measurement. And sometimes I may really want to know what is the state, so I go ahead and measure strongly. Okay, so these two slides have the whole summary of the, the rest of the talk, so I'll go a little bit slowly on them. So what I'm plotting here are histograms that you get if you prepare the, the system in spin up or spin down as a function of integration time, okay? For one photon, approximately one photon in the system, one microwave photon. If I measure for a very, very short period, extremely broad, right, because of voltage, I haven't integrated the signal. So this axis is really voltage, okay? That I get on many repeated measurements. And I'm going to define something that I call the measurement strength of signal to noise, which is really a ratio of the separation of the histograms relative to their width. Okay? So right now, they're clearly overlapping. It's not bigger than their width. Signal to noise is small. And as soon as I hit click, I'm going to start to increase the integration time. And you'll see what happens to the histograms. And you'll see a plot of the signal to noise here. Okay. Any time now would be great. There we go. Okay. So I'm measuring longer. I have better resolution, right, of my up and down, and my signal to noise is getting better and better. Okay. So this is if I prepare a spin down, I measure it, nothing happens, it stays there, it gives me this answer. If I put it in the other spin state, I get this. So here's the real question. What if I put it in zero plus one? What do I measure then? Right. What do I measure then? A caveat, a note here, is that all of these histogram widths are predictable by theory. And the upshot is they tell us our efficiency tip to tail is 50%. Okay, so every photon I put in the system, every two photons I measure one of them. If you compare to conventional electronics, the efficiency systems are doing pretty well here. So the question is, well, how do I update my guess, right? How do I update my best guess as to where the state is given some voltage measurement that I have, okay? So let me skip this for a second and go here. I prepare the system now in this spin zero plus one. And what you're going to see are two interesting things. This is the histogram that I would get, right? For the zero plus one state as a function of measurement time. So if I measure for zero time, I don't know where the system is. So it basically is right in the, in the middle of V1 and v, V0. Okay. And anyway, you see what happens. It starts to narrow, right? And as these histograms get better and better resolved, you see the zero plus, plus one measurement does something very quantum, right? In an ensemble sense, it splits up into two peaks. Meaning that in 50-50 superposition, half of the time I will measure it in zero, half of the time I will measure it in one. Right? This is what Niels Bohr told us. The other thing which is here, I want you to pay attention to this little green dot, which is here. And this little green dot corresponds to this graph here, and this is the integrated voltage. So this is the ensemble, this is one turn of the crank. So what this integrated voltage is telling you as time goes on, I'm learning more about the system. Right? In the beginning, this voltage fluctuates a lot, right? And then when I resolve the histogram, it gets pinned to one of the eigenstates. And that's actually what's happening when you're measuring a system. You see, you're sending light, which has fluctuations, right? There are fluctuations in the electromagnetic field. It kicks around your spin until you've integrated enough knowledge to know what the spin is. And once you know, then it's projected, right? And that's exactly what's happening here. So I'll replay this, right? And watch the little blue green dot, which will come on scale here, right? You see, and that's the integration. It's flopping around a lot. And as I continue, to, right, it goes up and down. And then at some point, you see, you start to separate the histograms, and then it gets pegged. Right? Then it gets pegged to an eigenstate. So this is really what's happening in our model of the measurement process. The fluctuations are kicking your state around. When you've integrated them to get enough knowledge in your system, 
to know what the state is, then you projected it. So projection happens when you know what the state is. Okay. So into what's happening traces. Okay. And then the question at hand is, you see, I have V0, V1. I'm just an experiment. There's no philosopher. Right. V0 is one is the other state. I have no problem telling them apart. Right? When I have V0, I have one state. When I have the question is, how do I state voltage in between? Right? How do I interpolate a voltage into a quantum state? And this is where we need to use a little bit of philosophy. Okay? And the idea here is we use Bayesian updating. Okay? So the Bayesian model of statistics tells us we start off with a prior guess. We gain a little bit of information, okay, and then we update our guess. So, never mind the name of the website, which is interesting, lesswrong.com, but oh, it's not bad. We start off with, if I ask you, Rafael, if it's going to rain or not, you will say 0% because we're in a drought, okay? But everything else being the same, well, that's using a piece of information. Everything else being the same is 50% chance of it raining. Then if you look at the forecast, right, you look at the forecast, you update your guess, based on some conditional probability. So in this case, you're looking at rain, what's the probability of rain, and you normalize. By what was there, you have a better guess. Okay. You do exactly the same with your qubit. Okay. And here are the voltage values, which correspond to being in the zero state and the one state. And if I measure a voltage, which is on this dashed line, I can update my probability that that voltage actually corresponds to being in the zero state, weighing the histogram that I have normalizing with what I started off with. So this little rule put forward by Lord Bayes, long, long classical statistics, is giving us a model to take little voltage increments and update our best guess for the quantum state. Okay? And the, the question that I have then is, do you believe it? Right? We can go ahead and update the state, but is it really believable? This classical rule from Lord Bayes, does it really describe a quantum process? The way to check that is as follows. I measure for a certain period of time, okay? And then I do this strong measurement. Remember I told you about weak and strong measurement? I integrate for a certain period of time, and then bam, I measure the quantum state, right? So immediately I know what it is at the end of the protocol. And the real question is, what I predict from this weak measurement, does it correlate to what my strong measurement gives me? Does that make sense to everyone? I make a measurement for a time, I make a weak measurement, I use my Bayes rule, which is here, to update my guess, and then I actually measure it to see if it actually corresponds to this. So here's the Bayesian prediction. If I have zero volts, that corresponds to me being on the horizontal equator. So that means Z is equal to zero, okay, there. And it's all in X, right? X is one, I'm using the arms of a clock that I'm showing here, the X is one, Z is zero, right, at that time. If I go to positive voltages, this means it's spin up. If I go to negative voltages, it's spin down. That's what I would extract from Bayes' rule. If I go ahead now and collect this tomographic data and I put it on top of this, you can see it matches perfectly. Right? So the Bayesian prediction, this classical prediction, does an exquisitely good job of telling you where the qubit most likely was when you actually measure it. And for aficionados in the audience, you may be asking, well, how do you actually do that? Because you can only measure once right, when you make a strong measurement. So here's the protocol. I make the weak measurement, I make a strong measurement. I repeat this a million times, right? I make a histogram of all those measurements, and I look at a certain value, let's say minus 0.1 volts, right? And I pull out all the tomographic data, the strong measurement data, for minus 0.1 volts, and that allows me to build the ensemble. Okay? So that's how I can check this idea. So you can see for a certain period of time, it's mapping nicely the question is now, can we map the entire trajectory, the entire tra traversal from a superposition state to an eigenstate? So here's a set of movies that I'll show you for this experiment, set of experiments. We start with the spin pointing here, okay, along the x-axis, which is up plus down, and then I can start the measurement, and that's what it does as time goes on. It goes up, it goes down, Okay, and then finally, after a while, it decides to stay there. It finds an eigenstate, okay? This is what was missing, okay, in our understanding of the measurement problem. We only knew that you started here at a superposition and you ended here. That's actually what it does in between by using this Bayesian updating. 
the last frame shows you these little dots. These little dots are this tomographic reconstruction, which we've done point by point on that trajectory to show you that not only does it degree at one point, it degrees for the whole trajectory. Right. So you can see the agreement is very good for the entire quantum trajectory. So how do you get the ensemble? You do that process again and again and average it and you get an ensemble. So here's a movie showing you four of them evolving in time. Okay. You can see here's the Z component. Some of them are going to spin up and some of them are going to spin down. Right. And that's indeed what should happen in a quantum system. Now I must admit, of course, we have chosen four, two of which will go up and two of which go down. <laughs> Give me a slide <laughs> to recover that. Okay. So these are two trajectories which are going to spin up, spin down. That's the X part going from one to zero. The dashed line shown here are the result of an ensemble average if I did measure a lot of them. And it does have the right behavior. On average, because half of the time it's up, half of the time it's down, and X goes from one because it was pointing here to zero. So you can go ahead and take, these are the same four traces that I showed you there, starting from this spin sideways to spin up and down and measure tens of thousands of them, if you wish, and make this density plot, okay? So what's shown here in the light regions, these are paths where you have lots of quantum trajectories going over, okay? So again, Copenhagen tells you you start here and you end up either here or here. This is the stuff we're filling in at the moment. Right? And you can see there's lots of action going up, lots of action going down, but there's some interesting cases in between as well. Right? There's a lot of other paths that the spin is taking as well as it goes to an eigenstate. This is what's happening to the X trajectory. So we can ask yet one more question. What if I kind of think about the quantum GPS question? If I start here, right, and I just fix a point on the sphere, saying I want to know all the paths that go from spin sideways to this value, minus 0.85, not to the eigenstate. So it's a particular point in Hilbert space. What are those trajectories? Those are the ones. Right? You can look in your ensemble of trajectories and look at all the ones that end on 0.85. Okay? Those are all the ones that go there. Okay? So the questions you can ask is, well, is there a most likely path? Experimentally, we can find one. Right? You look at all those trajectories and you find where they're all clustered. That's the most likely path in Hilbert space, not in space time, but in Hilbert space, moving between two points. And is there mathematics to predict this? There was not mathematics to predict this before our three collaborators worked on this problem. Okay. So how would you find the most likely path in Hilbert space? Well, it's the subject of two of these manuscripts if you want to go into the details. I won't spend a lot of time on them, but indeed on the cover issue, these are those same trajectories that I, that I showed. Okay, and how do you get across those? Well, we have to go back to a very well-known problem in theoretical physics. This is the part where I try to explain complicated math and you tell me I'm wrong. Good. We consider the problem of Kramer's escape. Right? If you have escape over a barrier, right, you have a saddle point, you have two stable attractors, right? and you can think of your canonical phase space in Hamiltonian mechanics as having position and momenta, P and Q, and you write an action that goes there and you minimize the action. This is the least action path or the path of least resistance as you like that takes you to the saddle point. We don't have that in quantum mechanics. So how do you write that in quantum mechanics? It was done by Andrew Jordan and coworkers. You think about two quantum states, okay? And you connect them, okay? In phase space by probability functionals, right? You figure out what's the probability to go from one state to the other state. And you can write a path integral, which is a product of these probabilities. So you propagate the solution in time. So that's fine. How do you do the action and the minimization? You only have a Q, there's no P, right? So you have to find a, a corresponding momentum by Lagrange multipliers. Okay? So if you do this with Lagrange multipliers, you get a P, which means nothing except that it's a P, which is conjugate to Q. And in this canonical phase space, you can go ahead and write down the action, the quantum action, you can minimize it to get an ordinary differential equation for the motion, very similar to what you would do in classical mechanics. The advantage of this is that you no longer have to work with stochastic calculus. Either the Ito or the Stratanovich form is not easy to deal with. So this gets rid of the stochastic calculus and restores for you ordinary differential equations. And you can calculate all the statistical properties and you could also treat the case of driving, right? I've only shown you measurement up till now. 
Perhaps we want to rob the oscillator or drive the system, right? How do you include that? This formalism lets you add it to the action. Okay, so this was the theory that Andrew Jordan and co-workers came up with. It turns out that if you're only looking at measurement, there's a closed form solution, right? And in reality, you can, these are the equations of motion for this optimized path. And in the case of low driving, where you're just measuring it, X is a sesh curve and Z is a tanch curve. So a very elegant prediction from Andrew Jordan. And if you look at the data here, the yellow dashed line is in fact this prediction, yellow matching yellow, and the magenta colored region is experimentally where the most likely path is. So you can see a spot on the red magenta curve with the yellow dashed line. So the prediction is very good for telling us what is the most popular path in Hilbert space. What is the path of least resistance? If you like, this is what is written in the abstract. This is the analogy to the geodesic, right? But in Hilbert space. Right, minimizing probabilities that are there, okay? So what about the case of driving, right? So there's a phenomenon called Rabi oscillation, which is well known in atomic physics. I have a two level system, right? Spin up, spin down. If I drive it on resonance, I will take G to E, right? take the ground state to the excited state. Then I continue to put energy in the system. It has no place to go. In the two level system, it pushes it back from E to G and goes back and forth, right? and hence the concept of an oscillation. Typically, when we measure Rabi oscillation, this is an ensemble measurement, right? You make it rattle back and forth, and you measure it again and again and again and again and again, and you get the following curve that the probability to be in the down state oscillates like this, okay? Right? You, you're projecting the state, you repeat it again and again. So this is the ensemble which is oscillating. We would like to measure one turn of the Rabi oscillation. Right? How does it look like in one element of the ensemble? Okay, and that's what this movie is showing us. So I'm driving the system now. This is the Arabi oscillation in real time. Showing you the block vector going, roughly speaking, around, around the sphere. And there are kinks there because, of course, measurement by you and by the environment, both, mostly by you, is happening at the same time. Okay, and here's the tomographic reconstruction, again, showing you one turn of that Rabi oscillation. Okay. If you want to recover this picture, then one should go ahead and average many such traces. So here's four of them, again. And you can see interesting things happen. Sometimes this blue one didn't want to go there. The, some measurement fluctuation pushed it up. Measurement was stronger, if you like, than the Rabi drive. Okay. And what I've plotted for you at the same time Okay, is this black dashed curve. That's the ensemble average. So that looks like your canonical Rabi oscillation. But there's something very, very interesting going on here. If you look at the amplitude of the ensemble average, it's much smaller than the individual traces. Right? So when you ensemble average Rabi oscillations, the amplitude is decreasing because of decoherence. Right? And information is being lost, so you're losing the phase. When you're tracking the system, there is no decoherence. There's no phase to lose. And you're constructing it and you're following it in real time, this is not decreasing in amplitude. So this is a stark statement that nothing is lost in quantum mechanics. Right? The information is still there. If you have it, then you can see the quantum behavior. Okay? If you do this again, tens of thousands of times and beyond, you get again the density plot shown here. So these are the individual Rabi traces, ensemble average shown in black, and there's very interesting features here. If you look here, it has sharp corners, right, in the distribution. And that was totally strange. When we first saw this, I thought it must be totally wrong. <laughs> How can you write a theory that would explain sharp corners that are there, right? How could an individual trajectory have a sharp corner in Hilbert space? In reality, they should be smooth, like your Rabi oscillating. And it turns out those are totally fine and should totally occur because, in fact, the system is pegged between spin up and spin down. So if I say I start at time zero and I stop here, this is the little leg of Rabi oscillation I can post-select and you can see the theory in the experiment low and the red. So the theory can predict for you the most likely path for Rabi oscillation also. If I stop later, you can see these weird shapes and it's doing a reasonable job of predicting it there and yet later as well, you can predict this. So we have X in agreement with this ordinary differential equations and the utility perhaps of this from an engineering standpoint is now that I can steer perhaps my system with measurement. I have a handle to the quantum world. I know what my detector should read 
for a corresponding reading in, in quantum space. So if I want to take a certain path, I know how to drive it right, from these equations. What can you do with this as we move towards a little bit the end of the talk? Well, the first thing we can do is go back to that problem of Rabi oscillations. Okay? The Rabi oscillation, the ensemble average decays right, in time. What if I wanted to preserve forever some Rabi oscillation? How could I do it? I'm just going to unplug this so I don't kill myself. It would be a very classical event. Okay. How could I preserve those Rabi oscillations? Well, I could track the phase in real time, right, and then correct for it. So this to engineers is known as a phase lock loop. Right? So if you have a poor oscillator, this is actually a very expensive oscillator, it's a qubit, but it's a very bad oscillator, right, Rabi flopping back and forth, the worst $1 million oscillator you can make. And the idea is you're driving this oscillator on resonance Right, at the Lamar frequency, that's what's causing it to Rabi flop. The amplitude of driving is actually setting the flopping rate. So it's a VCO, if you like. It's a voltage controlled oscillator. I drive it harder, it Rabi flops faster. If I want to improve this bad clock, the best way to do it classically is to take a 25 cent quartz oscillator, right, and compare it to that, and adjust in real time your qubit to account for that. And that's what we did. So here's, for example, with feedback off, the ensemble average Rabi oscillations, if you turn the feedback on, they can live forever. Okay. So again, going back to the idea that in a system, a quantum system that you measure and keep track of the phases, there's no decoherence. The one thing to note here is that I don't go back to the original amplitude. This is reflecting my 50% efficiency. If I had that other 50%, I would do a much better job. What else could you do with this measurement. Well, you can send quantum information from one two-level system or spin to another one. Okay? So here's a two-qubit system that I set up in such a way that when I measure the joint state, I cannot distinguish between 0, 1, 1, 0. However, I can distinguish between the product states 0, 0, and 1, 1. Okay? So this, technically, this is a half parity measurement. Right? I can tell apart this entangled Bell manifold from the product states, and remember, Observing is actually knowing the state. Right? Remember our Bayesian problem, if I know what the state it, it's in, it's in that state. I can never tell these two apart, so whenever I get a reading here, in fact, I entangle the system. Okay. This is where the experiment happens, and we separate the two qubits with 1.3 meters of coaxial cable. So the atomic physicists, they have large spools of fiber to separate this, although still not space-like separated. So the best we could do was put in one meter. That's what we did then. We couldn't put more than one meter, exactly 1.3. That's the coil. And if you look here, this is the concurrence, right? This off diagonal matrix element minus the product state, and it goes up and back down. And so we have witnessed the birth, life, and death of entanglement here, right? At time zero, there's no entanglement because you haven't measured. As time goes on, you entangle the system. And if you wait long enough, there's decoherence. And you can see it in your density matrix elements. So we're grateful to Professor Whaley and Mohan Sarover for the th theory line that goes through this curve. Okay? You can even watch the trajectories of the joint straight, and you can see how entanglement forms at the trajectory level, one turn of the crank at a time. So you look at the top state, in fact, this takes the state into an equal combination of 1, 0, 0, 1, giving you the entangled state. In another run of the experiment, you get the blue state, which in fact is the 0, 0 product state. So you can see this entanglement even at the individual trajectory level, okay? So what's next? Well, we'd like to measure more qubits in different arrangements. This part of the talk that I showed you is called measurement-based quantum feedback. Right? I measure the system, I correct for it. There's another flavor of feedback called autonomous feedback, okay? And the idea of this autonomous feedback is if you have a bath, right, that normally relaxes you to the ground state. Now, the ground state is uninteresting for us humans. It's a perfectly good quantum state. Right? If you rearrange the bath so it doesn't relax you into the ground state, maybe it relaxes you into a bell state, an entangled state. That's very interesting. So here's an example where two qubits can be arranged with a particular bath interaction so that indeed we end up with either the singlet or the triplet bell pair. So this is an example of autonomous feedback. And the efficiencies, even at the get-go, are significantly better than measurement-based feedback. Right? because there's no signal to get out of your system. 
there's no losses. And we are expanding the capability to do that and get more qubits. So here's three qubits inside the cavity. And in fact, these are set up to realize a Bose-Hubbard model. And in particular, this type of model can be used for quantum simulations of chemistry molecules, of material science, and the like. And all of these things tell us that now the eigenstate of the state space is, is complicated. Here are the states of a Bose-Hubbard model. And we are now developing the means to address each one of those many body levels. And we also have to read them out. So we need the next generation of amplifiers. And this particular flavor of amplifier that I've shown you is on chip. So it avoids, by clever interaction and engineering, the difficulties of getting information off chip by a circulator. And the, the clever thing that our theory collaborators in McGill have come up with in this amplifier is to put the signal in one quadrature and the fluctuations in the other one so that you can try to have your cake and eat it too. Okay. And moreover, as you measure more qubits, we need amplifiers to handle all those signals. And this is our superconducting version of a traveling wave amplifier. So in the atomic molecular physics domain, you can have erbium doped fibers to give you broadband amplification. This is our fiber. It's a transmission line made up of lots of Josephson junctions. And indeed, the first results show us this is the bandwidth of a paramp, a standard paramp. This is the multi gigahertz bandwidth of a traveling wave amplifier. So this is a game changer for us because we were relying on hemp amplifiers, high electron mobility transistor amplifiers up till now, and they add 50 or more photons of noise. This adds half a photon as mandated by quantum mechanics or so. So this is the next direction that we're trying to follow. And all of these individual bullet points that I showed you really lead to a, lead to a road where I consider simultaneous weak measurements of many qubits to take all the data that I showed you, but on an ensemble array, if you like, of 10 qubits or more. And the idea being is then you can think about how to reconstruct a many-body quantum system. Right? So you see in quantum information, we are encoding information into an ex extremely dense space space. You have zero and one, right? whereas classical computers are zero or one. But I also want to read zero and one, not zero or one. So if you have this, simultaneous measurement of all of your qubits, perhaps it's possible to do very efficient tomography or error correction, to do simulations as we talked about, to do thermodynamics in a quantum system, what does that actually mean? Right? If I put energy on one side of the system, where does it go? Right? There's no bath to dissipate it. What are the meanings of these questions? And in particular, to look at what if you measure two things which don't commute? Right? The Heisenberg uncertainty relation is on an ensemble level, or delta x and delta p, what does it mean on an individual trace? That being said, I want to show this slide as the end. Okay. I showed three other formulations of quantum mechanics. Right? I showed you the spontaneous collapse, the many worlds version, and Bowman mechanics. During the talk, I used this Bayesian updating procedure. And in fact, there's yet another interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is very different than the other ones. Right? This is called cubism, okay? or quantum Bayesianism. So cubism is very interesting, see? It says, a new version of quantum theory sweeps away the bizarre paradoxes because quantum information only exists in your imagination. Okay. So the Bayesian viewpoint is as following. The wave function doesn't represent reality, it represents your concept of reality. Okay. So the idea being that reality is subjective, not objective. And you see, it's radically different. It's not as if you have an objective world and you're trying to find the theory which explains it. You're saying that, well, that one may be very complicated. I may not be able to write that world. And you can see there's ecclesiastical overtones, no doubt, in that, right? The best we can do is our subjective understanding of the world, right? And that's a Bayesian update on this. So as information is gathered, right, the wave function tends to a certain point. So there is no collapse. The wave function is just telling me what I know. It goes to a particular state when I measure it. And there's no spooky action at a distance. Measurement is always needed to observe correlations. So this is a very interesting idea put forward really by Chris Fuchs and Rudiger Schack to think about quantum Bayesian interpretation, adding one more to the list of possible quantum interpretations. And it is a far cry from what Niels Bohr talked about, where he wanted to use quantum mechanics really for calculational tool. Right? At the same time, the fabulous physicist that he was, if you look at the second part of his statement, he certainly understood what quantum mechanics was really suggesting. Everything we call real is made up of things that cannot be regarded as real. If quantum mechanics has 
hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet, even though he was advocating only to use it as a calculational tool at some levels. So with that, we've reached the end of your, the hour, and I thank you for your attention. question if I understood it was, is there something particular about half a microsecond and is it related to decay processes on electrons and liquid helium? Okay. Time, in fact, is a parameter in quantum mechanics just like space. So in fact, the particular times here are a function of the measurement strengths we chose for convenience. We can, for example, take our qubit and measure it extremely weakly and it will live for a millisecond. And atomic species clearly live for extremely long periods of time. So no, there's nothing particularly special about that time except it being convenient. And to the second part of the question, I don't know what the current lifetime prediction is for electrons and liquid helium. I thought it's much longer than that, but I am not an expert in that particular field. You ask a very good question, which is if there are different ways to reconstruct your trajectory. This is particularly well suited to this approximation because you're just measuring sigma z uh, all the time. If you were to measure different observables and you had, for example, non-Markovian noise or other things, then clearly we would need something more. So the short answer is no, but at the same time, we haven't gotten to that situation yet and we'd love to get there. Yes, it doesn't. So your question is very valid. So the idea is as follows. If you want to reconstruct a trajectory point by point, we will have to take an entire family of trajectories. And for example, if you want to construct that particular value, I have to find all the other trajectories which also cross that point at that time and use that to make the ensemble reconstruction. So it's the same that I've done for the point wise deconstruction, but I move the point one step at a time later. So yes, it cannot be done with one unit of family. And in fact, David, this is how we want to go backwards. If we have a family of trajectories, can we use it to predict the initial state? And that's how one can try to do tomography on a quantum system from trajectories. So I'd like to ask a question about the cat paradox. Of course, it's a very vexing to get paradox. A little worrisome. Uh, Only if you have cats. Uh, right. Uh, but it seems to me that at a certain point, wave function gets so big and so complicated that we can't possibly uh, compute the state that it's in. And so there is no, if you even in theory cannot compute the quantum state, then you can forget about coherence and the paradox goes away. It seems like we ought to include uh, what can we possibly measure, what can we possibly compute as part of uh, mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, uh, this set of quantum paradoxes. Yes, it's, you ask a very good question. And it's a question on quantum complexity, right? In the sense that when does the system become so complex that it's intractable? And the question that I would ask, maybe just answering a question with a question, because I don't know the answer to your question, is if you really want to build a quantum computer, maybe you need 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth bits that should be well controlled. Can we actually do that? Right. This requires a little bit of thought. How complex it is to describe such a system, not in an Avogadro's number, I said it right, not in an Avogadro's, Avogadro's number, but in fact, uh, 10 to the 6. So that's a good point. I don't have the answer. And it's along the spirits of GRW, which is to say, when you have something which is big, you can have a domino-like collapse. 
but Uh, the question was about cubism. If I understood it correctly, Remy, it was along the lines of, does this imply whether the theory exists or not? This is a question in the ecclesiastical domain for a divinity school, so I plead the Fifth Amendment clearly and surely. Right, so the, the, uh, the point being is, you know, thanks to Heisman, we can't get rid of the fluctuations. So in this particular model, uh, you will have vacuum fluctuations, so on and so forth, which drive the state always. So they will be associated with whatever measuring tone you put in. So in the formalism, I don't see an immediate way out how, how to do that. But yes, if there were no fluctuations, then I would be perfectly happy. But that's, uh, we thank Heisenberg for fluctuations. Yes, there are, no, there are no correlations here in here. Again, the measurement operator commutes with itself at all times. If it doesn't, then that's a very interesting question. <laughs> It's parametric. It's parametric, and the only it's four wave mixing, and the only difference is with the four wave mixing in a single Josephson junction, the nonlinearity is enhanced by putting it in a cavity with a certain finesse, so that your photon bounce, bounces back and forth. Here we're, we're relaxing the cavity constraint and simply having it propagate down the line. the The tricky part is to have phase matching between all the waves, right? and there's a lot of detail and and, and engineering that goes there. A total one photon, so half by the amplifier. So this one is not phase preserving. Oh. This one is not phase, um, it's not single quadrature, it's measuring full. Okay. Mm -hmm. so that was, that the the uh, so what happens in this particular, if you measure, let's say, amplitude or phase, right, then you should do so perfectly, because that's where all the information is. If your information is split between two quadratures, you should measure both of them efficiently. So it's really no difference in terms of, uh, there's no fundamental factor of two that you lose. We just have to collect all the information properly. I see any more questions? If not, well, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.